Is the volume good? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, the, the biggest fear for any speaker is that one, that nobody will show, and then the second is that everybody will show. Um, so thank you all for coming and helping assuage a nice balance between those two. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm Amanda Kasseri, uh, the Principal Product Manager and Data Scientist for Concur Labs, for SAP Concur. Has anyone here heard of SAP Concur? Please raise your hands. Okay, so a few. So for those who haven't heard of it, uh, SAP Concur, we uh, do travel and expense. So we are an enterprise company. We've been around for over 20 years. Uh, we actually started off as shrink wrap software that you bought to put on your individual work computers so that you could better manage your travel and expenses. And now we're the global leader in, man in managed travel and expense uh, for enterprise companies. So the interesting things that I get to work on are things that you probably want nothing to do with, like how can I make your expense report life better? So it's an interesting challenge for me as a data scientist and as a product manager, because the thing I'm trying to optimize for is I don't want you in my software. I want to have as most efficient and streamlined software processes for you so that you can get on to doing the rest of your work, which is a little bit different than trying to capture people's attention to keep them involved with your medium. Uh, my whole team's goal is to figure out how can we help you even move further than where our current product is and be able to understand what are the new technology uh, horizons we're facing like Rebecca Parsons just talked about and how can we help our company understand that so that we can create better products for you. So I live at the nice intersection of that between product management and data science where I can start looking at things in different ways. So as a little bit more of an introduction to myself, uh, I am not a computer science PhD, so I come to data science from a different perspective. So I, I think it's important to identify the journeys that we take when we are approaching our job and our team and our work. So I have a background in everything from control systems engineering to um, some time spent as an officer in the United States Navy. Um, I spent some time not working and volunteering uh, around our country. Uh, I eventually went back to graduate school and I was supposed to be studying electrical engineering, but it turns out that I really love applied math and looking at systems level thinking. So I was fortunate enough to work at a cross disciplinary program where they valued that kind of interest and I was able to work with my, my thesis committee to be able to come up with an interesting problem to solve that combined applied math, computational science, um, looking at uh, systems across networks and then some electrical engineering because I still had to get that, that MS degree. But in the end, it ended up the classes I took actually formed what is now their PhD for data science. So it was a really great, um, really great combination for me to be where I am now. I was a stay-at-home mom for a little while. Uh, that was probably my most challenging role on this entire slide. Um, obviously, you all understand that bit. Uh, I, I worked at an underwater robotics company uh, before I became a consultant and then landed where I am now at SAP Concur. And then I have, of course, the things that help keep me interested when I'm not at work, which is I just finished a book with Alice Zhang. And then I also help volunteer with the NASA Data Knots. And uh, as, a, as a note here, if, you're, if that sounds cool to you, that whole NASA Data Knots thing, that is an international program. So if you are interested in working with data and with NASA and being involved in understanding with NASA experts and you like space, uh, they, they run cohorts uh, and they accept new people every six months or so. And you can get involved with um, international talks, working with other people, and then getting to kind of contribute to this global community that really just loves space and software. And so going a little bit more into, I think, uh, this, this may or may not be a crowd that already knows this, right? I think this is a frequent byline that gets used today. That data science is, is not magic, right? There's no, there's no middle layer in between here. And as much as we like it as a nice sales line that we can make all of this disappear between data and answers, I think we all know that there's actually a lot of work that exists between there. And so when we, we look at that process a little bit more and we understand that in order to get to this top level of, of ideal, of, of AI, of deep learning, there's a lot of things that have to be able to be instrumented and, and built before you can get to that piece. So in the best way, if you're looking for AI, for data science, for answers, for things that help feed these systems, then you're going about thinking it uh, systematically. But then the hard thing for that is that then as a person who is dealing with that um, on a day-to-day -day basis or on your computer, it's easy to look at these processes and start thinking about how these loops feed each other and you keep going back and it's, it's never linear, right? So I think a lot of the times that we, we introduce data science, machine learning problems, 
data center problems, it's always this nice workflow that looks like a direct acyclic graph, but that's not really what it looks like. It looks something more like some kinds of orbits that sometimes you get stuck in some of these like two or three group body problems. Sometimes you get stuck in the idea of research problem. And so when we think about it, I think it's very, very valuable for us to acknowledge for ourselves as well as for our teams that you're not going to move from one to the other and then always move forward. So in order to help out with that, um, you know, it's, it's better to explain this understanding that it's not just moving from, like we said earlier, from A to B. You don't just go from, from this idea of data to the answers that you were seeking for. Uh, and I have to do XKCD in every talk that I give. So this is my, this is the only time you'll see it this time, unfortunately, um, but I feel like when you are struggling with this on a day-to-day -day basis, they just really capture some of these problems so well. Um, but so the part we're going to focus on today, and uh, to be honest, I was a little bit nervous about this because um, I found the process of really diving into feature engineering so valuable for me because I think that there is a lot of times that I spend really just trying to gloss over this step because I want to move on to the next thing, right? And so we always think about um, this whole data to insights journey, and we think about the models, and we try to be careful in model selection and in choosing things, and a new paper comes out, and we want to try a new model. But really, when it comes down to it, that you can, there are processes you can go from raw data to models and answers. But that requires large amounts of data, which a lot of companies don't have or don't have access to. Or if we're starting to think about privacy by design, it means we are starting already to constrict the data that we're collecting in these processes because we're being more thoughtful about the data we're collecting and how it's impacting the user. And because of that, the models that we can use, we can use models that are much older and get useful results from those by being more thoughtful and thinking about the data and the features that we build from that and how can we maximize those features as opposed to just trying to collect more data. So really focusing on this one step, and I'm, I'm actually uh, not really going to go over the cleaning so much, but this, this part in moving from making educated choices to go from raw data to features in order to think about the models and the problem you're trying to solve. So wanting to level set, um, because in this kind of audience, we never know where people are at. If you're just interested in it, if you're starting it for the first time, I'm going to go over a few terms so that when I say them, that you understand that that's what I mean in this lecture. So First of all, for data science, we're talking about this interdisciplinary intersection. So there's methods and processes and algorithms, but it really all comes down to trying to extract knowledge from data. And so when we look at it that way, we can understand that machine learning can be a part of that, but it doesn't have to be, right? So machine learning is one piece that could help you solve that. When we say machine learning, I'm talking about fitting mathematical models to data in order to derive insights or make predictions. Those are two different aspects of machine learning. And then a feature is that numeric representation of an aspect of raw data. Feature engineering is the act of extracting those features from raw data and then transforming them into something that we can use for a machine learning model. So now that we have that set, the, the thing that is, is that the right features can only be defined in context of both the model and the data. So it, when I present these to you today, they're not going to be magical solutions that will help you take raw data and then understand exactly the model and the problem you're trying to solve. It's going to be food for thought so that you can make more educated choices in understanding your process. And then hopefully that will save you time instead of just taking things, applying some features that maybe somebody built a library for, putting that into the model the library was built for, and maybe you chose that feature selection because it fit that model you wanted to use, and then really trying to give more transparency into what that outcome will be, and being able to have that interpretability aspect. And then, of course, again, uh, being able to emphasize that by building things and building systems that people use, uh, we have a responsibility as creators to the systems and the software that we build. And so when we think of data, uh, there's a lot of different ways that we view it, but in reality, we need to continually remind ourselves and remind each other that data is just an abstract representation of reality. It is not reality itself. So when you're building systems and you're building processes that make automated decisions, you need to remember that data is a part of the system of record, but it should not be the actual system itself, and we should not assume that it is the actual system itself. 
as a part of this, data captures what we call social constructs. And all social constructs are, are these, this joint constructed understanding of how we re represent the world that forms a basis for, uh, for being able to communicate with other people. But because we do that, we have to also realize that these social constructs are, are limited and that they may not include all of the aspects of the community or the idea that we're trying to be able to capture. An example of this would be how we capture gender in a lot of current systems. So right now, gender in a lot of our systems is male and female. But as we learn more and understand more about the world around us and about the people around us, we need to acknowledge that this is actually not sufficient and we need better ways of representing these social constructs so that we have a richer understanding of the, of the data and the community and the system that exists. Um, when we don't do this, when we are limiting that social construct based off of a sub-community as opposed to the entire system, we will have bias in the system. And so from this I mean um, statistical bias, and statistical bias is when we get results from an unfair sampling of the population. So we have assumptions that we are creating a fair sampling, but in reality we are not. And so in order to be able to combat this, we need to have teams that have a larger viewpoint than just our own. And as a part of that is understanding that you have accountability. So as I talked about before, as creating things and putting things out into the world, uh, whatever you are creating, you're going to be answerable for those decisions and obligated to explain the results of those consequences. So I think that the ability for us to be able to say that we made something, but it's not actually something that we should be responsible for, regardless of what that thing is, is, is quickly coming to a close if it ever existed. This idea of accountability has existed in engineering forever. I've actually taken three professional ethics classes now in engineering alone just to be able to talk about accountability around your design systems. So I like to bring this up and, and remind people that this is something that, once again, we should challenge each other on as well as challenge ourselves when we're designing things for people. And then, fantastically, this is all the time I really have to spend on this particular focus because Catherine will be talking about this at 2.30 today, so it's a great time for you to go and learn more about AI and machine learning in a little while. Okay, so moving forward, how should you think about, I think one of the things I promised in my abstract was giving you a framework to think about feature engineering, uh, which I really honestly forgot until about 30 minutes ago. So this is, um, this is a bonus, congratulations. Uh, but really, I'm trying to go about summarizing everything else you're about to see in the individual techniques so that you can start thinking about and understanding that now. So as we talk about all these techniques, it's a part of the process that we're introducing. So the first thing is really to think about how do we frame your problem? And the reason I say that is because I think there's a tendency in technology to get excited about new tools and new techniques and wanting to try them out. And so in order to validate a technique or, or a technique or a new tool, we take some data and we put it through and then the problem kind of comes second. And so the engineering training that I have and the, the other background that I have, I actually have a different focus where I always wanna try to figure out what is the problem I need to solve and then how can I figure out and find the right tools to help me solve that problem regardless of whatever that is, right? So things that are most efficient as possible. And then honestly, that are easiest to explain to other people. And so as a part of that, you can frame certain problems. So they are a machine learning problem, right? So I think this is a little bit of the fun creativity that, that comes from being technologist, where we get to say, okay, I hear you saying this. I think I can help you solve that if I frame it this way. And if I frame it this way, then we can honestly really go back and mathematically model that using linear algebra usually, using linear algebra this way. And if I can do that, that problem then can be a machine learning problem and we can use the software we have now or that we create to solve that. Uh, so in order to do that, in order to frame your problem, you need to go to the data that you have or that you potentially could have. So understanding what data would be most useful to understanding and also generating a better understanding of that problem. And I say generating a better understanding because as part of this feedback loop in this machine learning process, when you're thinking about the problem, you can think about here's what I have now, here's where I start, here's where I would wanna move in the future. In order to move in the future, I need this additional piece. How can I create and design my system so that this piece does not exist now, but it will in the future, and then how will I adapt and adjust over time? The third part is going to be framing your feature goals. And when I talk about that, these are just some examples, but I want to be able to help you understand that uh, we need to think about what we're optimizing for, right? So once again, the honestly, the greatest gift that feature engineering has given me over the years is really cutting down on this iteration speed. So it's very easy to take, we, 
wonderful people have created so that many libraries work with many different um, data types. However, it is much more efficient to use some of those more sparse uh, numerical representations than it is to use those richer data frames that exist and have a lot of meta metadata around them. So if you're thinking about the value of your process comes from your ability to learn new things as you're trying to solve the problem, iteration speed is critical because this is really what's going to help you move forward. The other part is going to be thinking about model performance, the model that you're choosing, um, the kind of features that you're building in order to optimize for certain kinds of models, and then also so that you don't stress the model out and then get some, uh, useless some useless results. And then the final part is really understanding now you're going into a test and integration loop. And so when you're choosing these features, that you're going to check your choices for robustness, but in the end, you're going to still have to validate and realize these results will change, and that it, being okay with that. So once a decision is made and you've done a lot of work and you've tried some things out and it's good, reality changes, systems change. I think um, like Holden said yesterday, you know, we, we run the systems now forever, but that doesn't mean that reality around it will not be changing. So we need to make sure we have the processes and the mindset in place that you can continue to adjust for this. Okay, so now um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little bit of a warning out. If, if for some reason you were ever been the kind of person who thought you're not a math person, I want to encourage you that I think that you are and that's learned and not inherent. So I'm going to uh, spend the rest of the time going uh, fairly deep into a few different techniques, and it's going to be more about this framework, this process, understanding more of what features give us um, in a math context as opposed to an application process. So the applied versions of everything I'm talking about, you can get in our GitHub repo for the book, and I'll give that to you at the end. And so we take uh, the approach that we took is we took all of these different ideas and contexts and techniques, we really try to peel back and understand why we do these things, what are the mathematical principles behind it, and then how can we help you understand how that's going to then work and affect your work in the future, and then giving you a really simple understanding of how that could happen. I'm also going to say that there are going to be times when you might be reading through the examples and you're like, but this didn't work out well the first time. And we, we worked really hard to leave all of that work in there and visible. And the reason we did that is because I, I find it very challenging to see the subliminal example given for each software package and go, but that's not what my code says right now. Right, so you have the trace back and you have the ability to go back and understand things, but I think making it a little bit more visible when it's not going right the first time is really helpful. And then walking people through the process and explaining how you move to, from one start to the next, we're hoping that you find that valuable. And I would love to hear feedback as whether or not you thought that was good or it just took up too much space on the pages. So starting off here, um, really scaling it back. So a scalar in the idea of mathematics, linear algebra, things we're talking about, computer science, a scalar is a singular, or is a single numeric feature. And then when we have an ordered list of scalars, this is known as a vector. So now we're going to be talking about vector space. So we can represent these vectors, um, like a two-dimensional vector of V can be represented now in what we call vector space. And so a majority of machine learning applications, the input to the model is usually represented as a numeric vector. So if you're struggling or getting errors or tried to work on something, really understand that that model is expecting this representation. And if you don't have that present, then you're going to start running into some problems from the beginning. So if we think about that as, um, as a vector, for two-dimensional models, we can actually show this uh, as a point in space. So we don't always, I think in mathematics, we, we have a tendency to draw um, like the direction and the arrow. But over time, you'll start seeing for vector space, we really just represent it as that one point in a two-dimensional space. OK, so we have vector space and we have scalars. But now we're moving to the idea of feature space. And so in data, when we move from vector space or from data space to feature space, then we're talking more about the representation of what that's supposed to mean as opposed to um, just a numeric vector. So really kind of understanding how we can take information and have that be represented as a person's preference in songs. So we do that here with the idea that um, if the song is the feature that we're trying to get, uh, then we can represent that as either a plus one, somebody likes it, or as a negative one, someone doesn't like that song. So then we can start moving from data and feature space and then features back to data space. And the difference here is going to be the point representation as well as the axes that it represents. So now, um, 
Does Sesame Street translate well here? Can I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Is that okay? Um, so uh, I, I'm going to be spending, and I, I promise you, you might have not ever spent this much time before thinking just about count data. Um, but I'm hoping that by what we talk about, that you'll realize that there's a lot more that you can get out of it rather than just the raw counts. So the first part is, um, is binarization, right? And so when you want to think about using binarization is when you have raw data and you want to understand how you can more efficiently represent raw data as, um, as a presence. So as a one or a zero, as a yes or a no. So if you have a list of people and you have a list of song counts of things that they've listened to, um, then really the idea that you have to start looking at is, do you really need that song count, right? So if somebody has listened to a song 4,000 times and someone else has listened to that same song um, 400 times, does that one person who listened to it 4,000, can you effectively say that they like it 100 times more than the other person, or 10 times more, sorry, um, 10 times more than the other person who listened to it 400 times? I think in there, when you're looking at the effectiveness of scale, that's when you want to start considering that it's probably more efficient just to understand someone likes or does not like a song, and then you can represent that as a zero or a one, or if they've listened to it as more effectively as a zero or a one. Uh, that, so that gives you a more efficient representation of, um, of the raw count as well as a more robust measure of the raw count. And so when I say robustness, statistical robustness is when a method works under a variety of conditions. But the thing that you, you might lose out of this is that you might need to modify the target of your model. Um, in order to actually solve the right problem. So in, instead of trying, like we said, how much does someone like a song may not be answer, answerable with that linear, um, that linear model that you were previously working with, but you can maybe answer, would somebody like a song like this, where you can take those, they've listened to it or they've not, create a collaborative filter, and then actually help being able to recommend new songs to people. Okay, so from, from binarization, we have ones and zeros, and now we can start thinking about binning. And so we can see that reducing our data is, is really helpful for um, reducing iteration and processing times. But if we want to look at other ways we can transform raw counts, then we can look at things, uh, things like how people are thinking about um, those raw counts as an order of magnitude or as the scale of the way th or of the distribution of the way that the raw counts exist underneath. And so one of the problems that we can have is that a lot of machine learning models have, uh, have a real challenge dealing with these long tail distributions. So when you have those several orders of magnitude that you exist within the variable you're trying to work with, it's, it's better to start looking at, um, it's better to start looking at how you can transform this feature and how you can contain the scale by quantizing the count. And so this is really what binning gives us, right? Binning gives us a way to be able to say we're still capturing that information at, this, at a scale that across a distribution is easy for us to understand and is easy for us to still capture at a higher level of what we're trying to get out of, out of the process. But it's not going into so far of a detail that when you're dealing with uh, like unsupervised learning methods that you're going to start having a problem when the Euclidean, the Euclidean distance as a similarity function um, is going to start really getting affected by these large distributions and these long tails. So if we quantize the count um, and we get rid of the bins and get rid of the actual number counts, then we now move from a continuous variable to a discrete one, which is much easier to work with in the machine learning world. Uh, and so the idea, there's different kinds of ways that we can do binning. Um, one of those is fixed width binning. And I, to be honest, I really didn't like the graphic for this, so that's why you're, you're getting the code instead. But the idea is, is that um, each bin is now going to have the data that contains within a specific range. So we're really just taking data and putting it into buckets with other data like that and reducing the amount of complexity that exists in the space. And so when we see things like this for numbers, um, it's easy to try to think about how we can group this into other numbers like themselves. Other forms of fixed width binning that we can do may not be something that is, um, is actually uh, consistently uh, consistent across the bins. So if we're trying to look at binning age, it may actually make more sense, especially if you're doing um, evaluations of health or trying to understand um, like disease modeling. It might make more sense to look at things like um, across a lifespan, the different stages of life and development, in which case you may have bins that are as small as months 
years or in decades. So understand that when you're looking at the binning, you should really try to look more at the context of the variable underneath it and not just what makes like an easy quick sense. And then we also can do uh, adaptive binning, right? So fixed with binning, it's, it's easy to compute. But if there's large gaps in the data, there may be empty bins with no data. And so we can address that by doing adaptive binning. And adaptive binning is looking at things more like quantiles or deciles. So taking 10%, 20%, 30%, actually looking at the distribution and grouping it that way, as opposed to, as opposed to just taking and chunking out in that fixed width. Uh, the, the benefit for that is that you start working more with medians and with the, um, the statistical distribution of the underlying data, as opposed to ten, kind of taking that blind approach from the beginning. Let me do a quick time check. Okay, so uh, log transform binning. Uh, when we think about um, numbers spanning multiple magnitudes, it may be better to be able to group those by powers of 10, right? And so what we get out of that is that that log function then compresses down that range of large numbers and expands the range of small numbers. So once again, we were talking about that uh, these exponential distributions that we're working with in the raw form can really cause havoc with some of the machine learning models that you're trying to work with because they like things like Gaussian distributions or normalized distributions. So there's ways that we can do uh, log transform to be able to make that, uh, to be able to capture the information in a way that still preserves the underlying data, but then really takes it and transforms it so that the, the models can perform better and give you better results. Uh, scaling. So now when we think about, so moving from, uh, we're still working with counts, again, by the way, so once again, we're still in this count world, there's a lot you can do with it. But now we are starting to think about, uh, about the scale of the, of the data that you're working with and the scale of the, of the variable, the raw counts, the, the features that you're working with. And so the reason we bring this up is that because some features like latitude or longitude are bounded, right? They exist within a certain range. We know what we're going to expect. So when we're building systems and we're building systems that depend on distributions or on counts, that we know that we're not going to have the model blow up because it exists now in a new, um, a new, range that we didn't before experience. But the other things, uh, numeric features like counts and likes, um, things that exist in some of the systems we build now that are recommenders or things that are social media, those now with the idea I think we've had for years now of going viral, now you may start to experience levels you did not predict previously and that your system still need, and your models still need to be able to adjust and understand for. So when we, we look at that and we look at how, uh, how models that are smooth functions of the input, which linear regression is, um, anything that involves that matrix is going to be affected by the scale of the input. So you can still take your original data, but now you kind of want to scrunch it down into something that becomes bounded and something that you can consistently see results from in your model over time. So one of the ways that we can do this is, uh, is feature scaling um, and normalization. And so there's a few different methods we're gonna talk about. One of those is min-max scaling. Uh, and so the idea of min-max scaling is that you take all of, the, fee all of the, uh, the feature values and then you compress them down into a range between zero and one. And so it doesn't really matter whether or not it's gonna be something that ever appears outside of what you were working with before. As long as you continue to update over time, and once again, this is, this is really where that validate interaction loop really comes uh, to be important, is that over time, if you don't do this updating of that scale, then you'll essentially start getting things things are going to be out of bound. So you need to make sure that you're doing updates to your system and updates to your features when you have a model in production or out in the world. Um, but the good thing about this is that, is that for, for things like min-max scaling, everything we're going to talk about, um, because we're always dividing by a constant, the shape of the single feature distribution won't change. And so we'll show you that at the end where you can actually see that um, that shape is maintained over time. Um, the next thing is standardization. So then once again, we're going back to, to statistics. I'm gonna be taking uh, the, the mean and the variance, and then once again, you get results between zero and one. And so again, you're taking what could be an unbounded uh, condition or an unbounded variable, and you're bounding it. And then by updating over time, you're gonna be making sure that you're not falling off the rails. Um, the thing I wanna add some caution here though, is that when you perform min-max scaling or standardization on sparse features, um, the problem is, is that you, you could actually, sh like for min-max, if it's very sparse, 
if you're using uh, the mean, then you could start to shift, um, shift the distribution in a way that you is not desirable for you. So if the shift isn't zero, then the two transforms can turn a sparse feature vector into a dense one. So if that's something that can first of all slow down your processing time. We all love actually sparse data sets because it's very efficient to work with. But if you want to make sure that uh, you're not creating that computational burden, then you need to understand that for sparse data sets, this is something that you may want to avoid. Uh, feature scaling, so the next thing for, uh, for is the L2 normalization. So it's the idea, again, that we're trying to look at, instead of going from zero to one, of a two-dimensional space. And so this becomes useful for you when you don't want to exist in the zero to one world. There's other things that uh, L2 normalization can give you, um, which uh, we, when we're looking at understanding across uh, gradients, that can be more useful than understanding things from that number line presentation. So I think we talked about this already, but once again, going into the, the feature in scaling is really most useful when a set of input features are going to differ widely in scale, right? So when we're looking at, um, at trying to understand how we can help understand how we can help turn that scale down for unbounded features, bring them into an area that is able to be wrangled and worked with, uh, then we can uh, have numeric stability for the models that we're training. And then we still capture, again, we're not going to be able, we're not losing the underlying statistical, statistical distributions, which is going to give us that robustness over time. Um, next, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about text, since we just spent so much time talking about counts. Uh, and once again, some of these, some of these uh, techniques, I think I, I really worked with a lot previously in a way that was, um, probably more naive into understanding the richness that you can get out of them. Uh, and so we're going to talk about a few, uh, but the reason that I want to kind of build up and introduce first is that I think that we, we talked a lot about um, numerical data, and then if you come from a quantitative background, or if you come from an area in engineering, that's always been the focus. And so I think uh, for years now, you know, information collection, information um, theory, a lot of people have been working more with text, but it's really only been in, I would say, like the past, um, kind of the past generation of when we're looking at how can we really take text at scale and gain more understanding from them in a computational way. And so uh, I'd love to show this project. Um, it's from the University of Vermont. It's um, the uh, computational storytelling team. And so for years, and you can see at the timeline down there, for years they've been trying to understand and gain a signal on the happiness of the world by using Twitter as their sensor. And so I think they were, they were one of the initial teams to start looking at this metric, and they used initially blogs and the New York Times and music songs, but taking those ideas and really kind of distilling them down and trying to say, when we, and once again, this is 10 years later, right? So it's not, not as cutting edge now. But I think they've done, they did a really good job in trying to say, how can we start looking at the signals that we're creating and the software si systems we're creating and taking that information and then turning it in a way that really is numerical, but then expressing that numerical representation again as something that is as a social um, piece and a social aspect. So when we're talking about text, understanding that within this text is not just numbers and things we're representing. There's a lot of context behind it. And so I think that, um, once again, I think Rebecca Parsons did a wonderful job talking about this in her keynote this morning and saying that when we're technologists working as a part of a team, we'll gain so much more understanding and ability to be able to further our systems by working with people who have a richer understanding of what we're dealing with, working with linguists, working with people who are computational linguists, working with philosophers, working with social scientists, because they'll understand the information we're trying to capture and analyze and turn into these mathematical models uh, at, a, at a depth and a feeling of something that we may not be able to get to without that help. So that collaboration piece will be very useful moving forward. Um, and so to kind of step back from that, in order to do that, you need to have some ways of taking that rich context and really trying to shrink it down onto something, once again, you can fit into like a linear algebra model. And so the first way that we do this uh, is bag of words. And the idea of bag of words is how can I make the simplest representation possible from a group of text? And so the thing that you get this is it takes natural text and it forms it into flat vectors. And once again, we like flat vectors. We like long, skinny vectors. These are where we optimize and work with best. The, 
We get simple, interpretable results from working with bag of words. So it's always a good starting point um, because all of the words have equal elements within that vector. But the thing that we, we quickly move into once you start with this context, the thing that we quickly move into with this, uh, this technique is now that you realize at some point you're removing the semantic understanding of the word. So I'd say like kind of going to Google Translate um, or other translation uh, other translation algorithms, it's always easiest to start with, let's just do one for one swap, right? That's really what bag of words can give you. It can give you essentially a hashing function. You can do a one for one swap. But then you start looking at like, well, it makes no sense when I strip out all that semantic context. So there will be other ways that we talk about that you can gain and keep that semantic context. The best example I can, I can give you for this of how that would exist is that um, if you have the phrase, not bad in a sentence, right? When you, when you move it into bag of words, now it get, gets represented as not and, and bad. So one not, one bad. So now if you're doing something like sentiment analysis, which is always very popular, if you're doing sentiment analysis, now instead of it looking like, oh, it's, it's okay because it's not bad, now it becomes something that's usually associated negatively, which is not and bad. So we need to make sure that uh, whatever use case that we are using or whatever problem we're trying to solve, if semantic representation is important, then bag of words, uh, it may get you going, but it may give you not the, the results that you're looking for. It also doesn't contain word hierarchy. So most languages, uh, there is an order in the way that we speak, the way that we write, the way that we're representing information uh, with words. And then bag of words strips all of that out as well. So we, as we're looking at text and better ways to work with it, one of the things that uh, you might notice is that when you, if you do something like bag of words and you order that list, then you'll start to see that some of these words are used more frequently than others. Those might not be so useful to you because we use them in language to make sense of the things that we're saying so that we don't strip things down essentially to really kind of emoji, emoji paragraphs, hieroglyphics, or, um, or speak where it's just kind of that, that talk where it's like, yes, hungry. Um, but so you want to add more context to that, so we add things in between. The way that we handle this when we're working with, with machine learning and with data to make it more efficient is that we do things called stop word removal. And so a stop word is, is something that is in a corpus that you would really like to take out. And so one way that you could do that would be um, using a frequency list, uh, which which also is very useful. So if you'll see, um, like in, in 21, in rank, it can actually start helping you find things too that you didn't realize before that some of your previous techniques uh, might be showing about the way that text is formed. And so this is based off of the Yelp reviews um, data set. And what that is, is it's a collection of restaurant and place reviews. And so as part of the data processing here, when they give you the Yelp reviews, they started to strip out things like um, punctuation and colons, and, and but, they, but they replaced it with white space. And in doing so, in English, when they had a possessive, um, a possessive pronoun like um, Jackie's or Freddie's, or if they had something that was a, a, a verb con um, contraction, so if, um, like. Oh, like, or not sorry, verb contraction, but, but plural possessive, like it's, or yeah, it's is a verb, then you're going to get the standalone S. Standalone S is not useful to you perhaps in this context, right? So it'll actually start showing you not just the stop words you should be pulling out, but also will give you a little bit richer information about the data that you're dealing with, how it was prepared, and how you need to make sure that you're working with it in the future and what's notable to you. The other thing it can be useful is showing you things in a corpus that you, you may not pull out in a stop word list usually, but you might want to in this context. So the New York Times data set, the New York Times, shows up so much that really it, re it loses that value in New York itself for new. You're going to want to take those out because, because of the frequency it's mentioned, it's not going to give you a lot of information uh, further on. Uh, so moving into the next part, and I guess I, I timed this well. So looking more at things like chunking, parts of speech, um, parts of speech, uh, identification, uh, n-grams, trigrams, um, we, call them, we call them, I think, bag of x, uh, to be able to understand that you're going to go through these different x variations. Um, all of this really comes together in how can we preserve that context and how can we preserve those semantics and the meaning around it. And when it all really comes back to it, 
Did anybody do sentence diagramming in school at any point? Was this just me? Can you raise your hands if you did this, please, so I know that, I, that somebody remembers this? Okay, two in the corner, that's it. Three, okay, all right, great. Yeah, so um, as a part of, a long time ago, as a part of um, classes for language, and I, I think I did this in Latin classes as well, one of the things that we did was learning how to take a sentence and then using different structures and parts of speech tagging, which is what we were doing really as children, right? We did parts of speech tagging and we laid out in a visual representation how we could show the meaning of that sentence and then break out and understand those different pieces. And so this example is from Pop the pop chart lab for NPR, and this goes to a great link, talking actually about how um, there's a hypothesis that this kind of uh, information is going away. But I think that actually as, uh, as engineers and, and scientists, this is what we're trying to do with these more advanced techniques and computational linguists are trying to create algorithms for to help capture this. So I think that once again, by not just working in a bubble and thinking about the technique, but understanding more of the problem we're trying to solve, we can gather more of these ideas to be able to create new techniques to have a better understanding. Um, so I think that we, we have time for questions. I, I'm gonna put out there that I brought, I brought three books today. Um, so for the first three questions, then you get a book. Um, please come up afterwards and I'll be happy to talk about it or sign it with you. Um, we also have uh, our code it will be available with the slides. It's all in a code repo. You can get all of it on GitHub. Whether or not you buy the book, it's fine. And then if you're interested in buying the book, then the link is there as well. Um, so thank you very much. Omana, thank you for the pre great presentation. I'd like to know your thoughts. We, we have been heard uh, very much about uh, automated machine learning, yes. and I think feature engineering is an important part of that, but it's pretty difficult. How do you see the new techniques like deep learning applying this field? How much uh, automated this process can be in your thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, the, so uh, the question was is um, thoughts around automated machine learning and automated processes as we continue to build AutoML. And so I think, uh, I think AutoML is, is great. I'm glad we're working on it. Uh, but I think once again that a lot of the things that we're working on, we have to be able to acknowledge these human in the loop decision processes. And so as we build those systems and these algorithms that are looking to be able to optimize parts of the pipeline for us, then, and part of the processes for us, then really what we need to be considering is how are we going to design these processes so that they're transparent and observable and there's ways that you understand the decisions that the machine and the software are making so that you can go in and adjust based off of off of your human in the loop interaction so I think that um, I, I mean I don't like writing libraries from scratch if they're already written for me. I'm very grateful for the open source community. So I, I think that I'm not so much as a pessimist to say I think we shouldn't move in that direction. I think it more it's the careful software design and considerations as we're building these to make sure that we are able to uh, be transparent about the decision these things are making and be able to make those thoughtful considerations. Yeah. Hello, Amanda. Congrats Hello. for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, what do you consider the main challenges today when regarding to text processing and sentiment analysis? Yeah, okay, so the question was, is the, the biggest problems for text processing and sentiment analysis? Um, and so I, I had a very wonderful discussion um, with a computational linguist about this recently, and the question I asked him was, what are we missing? Like, what, are, what do you think people don't spend enough time on? And his response, um, and actually I'll, I'll make sure I tweet his, his handle out afterwards so that way you can, you can follow him and see more of what the work he's doing. Um, so this, I guess, to give a little context, this person uh, that I'm talking about, um, his current work at his job is to be a feature engineer. So the way that company is starting to evolve and build, and so it's, it's the company is Textio. And so the way that company is building, evolving, and understanding that their tool is going to be entirely dependent on data and AI processes. They're valuing his role as a computational linguist in feature engineering to be one of the key pivotal roles in the engineering team. 
And so when he and I were talking about it, he was saying that there's been a lot of work with word embedding, and there's been a lot of work with sentence embedding and with um, you know, bags of embeddings. But the problem with that is that you're leaving a lot of that semantic decision-making process to somebody else. So they've already made the decisions what, what corpus is important and how they're going to have those biases in there, but, they, they, but they're leaving it out for you. Um, they've made all of those semantic decisions for you, and that's why it's easy to use, but also means that now you're sacrificing those decision-making processes, and it's it's more difficult for you to make transparent processes that make it clear the decisions you're trading off for. So his advice was to start looking more at things that, are, um, that allow you to be more in control of those parts. So looking at parts of speech tagging, that's why I brought the sentence diagramming up because that was one of his suggestions was to start looking at how can you understand how to extract more of the context, um, parts of speech, um, the, the groupings that people put words in. And he said, because when you, when you are creating language, these are the decisions that you are making as a person to be very deliberate in how you're conveying your information. So if we want computers to be able to capture that deliberateness, we need to pay more attention to the things that humans do and less attention to the things that someone else has already tried to build in for us. Yeah. Okay. If I'm Ali from Dayton, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is more like in the design phase. When you design the product, not only apply, how feature engineering is usually combined with the designing the product part? Yeah, so a uh, great question. The question is how to think about feature engineering in the design part. Um, so I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially with GDPR, because I feel like the uh, privacy by, by design and some of the explicit and implicit rights that exist within GDPR really force us to take a new look at data collection and then also at um, how we're going to understand and and, and take the data that exists and be able to maximize things as possible. So one of the ways that, that I'm thinking about it, and this could be right or wrong, it's an evolutionary process. One of the ways that I'm looking about this is trying to do more of that problem statement uh, upfront and really not kind of falling back on, I've gone away from block diagrams back into documents, um, which has been interesting. So instead of trying to simplify the problem down in the beginning into a napkin sketch, I've actually gone back into the idea of like, how can I fully describe a problem in as, you know, as few words as possible, hopefully, because nobody wants to read 30 pages of my ideas on this. Um, but if I'm trying to communicate to my team that I have an idea for something I want to build, and once again, this is kind of going to that data flywheel idea where you have an intelligent product you want to build. And in order to build an intelligent product, you need data. But in order to get that data, you need to build something to collect that data, right? So it's like this, this uh, virtuous cycle that you're creating. So if you're able to look that forward in the future, you should be able to do product design moving back, which will help you understand features and raw data more. And you can identify your hypothesis for these next few steps a little bit earlier on with the complete understanding that you may be totally wrong in this data collection. But I think that's how I'm trying to approach it more as a data acquisition strategy, which then turns into feature transformation strategy, because the problem I'm trying to solve is this class of problem. And knowing these algorithms expect these kinds of features, I can go back and try to look more at the raw data to collect. Amanda, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.